slaughter or daughter? <laughs> so I always thought like Dillard was always on shrooms, but it's just coffee. <laughs> Give me more gay. It needs to be more gay. Her deal, what's her deal? Hey. Hey, people. It's your boy Nate. I read books because reading is sexy. And if you're not reading, you're not sexy. Here to do an April reading wrap up. Is this fine? Is the hair fine? I woke up from a nap. Much needed nap. Very nice. It is the first of May. It was a gorgeous day, too. I should have gone outside, but I had to do some work stuff and YouTube stuff, and uh, that took the wind out of me, so I took a nap. It was nice. Today's a holiday. It was May 1st, and present day Nathan, or I guess future me, here to dip in through all these past vlogs to give you, yes, a rundown of a very busy reading month. I, I, I went crazy. I think, <laughs> I don't know, I am I avoiding real life? I don't know. April was a lot. There was much, much doing. Commotions, many commotions going on, went on. It's the past now. It was busy. It was busy. I did I did too much and and I'm exhausted, but what's new? Right? I think just like being tired is just a natural state of my being. So it's like I don't have to talk about it. Does that make any sense? Okay. Anyway, 17 books, a good mix of digital ARCs and physical books. Mind you though, it's not that much because half the books were poetry, so Yes. As per usual, going to give like a flash review of the books as I will give longer and fuller reviews in future vlogs. So stay tuned. Okay. So started the month strong with Paris, the memoir, which was wonderful. I think Paris gives a very honest portrait of her life with ADHD and her past experiences and opening up about them through the, I forget what they're called, but they're these reformation schools for, you know, misbehaved teens, for the posh and elite and actually how super abusive they were. And Paris goes into all the abuse that went on in those schools and eventually leads up to why she does activist work and in closing down all of these schools across the states. Very surprising that they still exist, as some of these schools were also gay conversion therapy schools as well. Just, oof, just a lot. It was a lot. And Paris took the time to open up and speak about it honestly while also having a great sense of humor yeah, an overall charm to everything. Using her ADHD also as a way of narrating and sort of like popcorning details, events, and ideas and thoughts that she had throughout all of this. Also, I'm losing light. I thought I'd film this using natural light because it's actually a really gorgeous day, but now I'm losing light. So I might have to turn on a light on, but let's, let's see. This light has been odd. It has been like coming in strong and coming out let me see how far I can go, all right? Okay, but yes, Paris the Memoir. If if you're a stan of the simple life, pick this one up. It's, it's a good one. It's a fun one. Okay, next up I read Greek Lessons by Hong Gong, which tells the story of a person going blind and a person who cannot speak and a relationship between the two in this sort of very cold, detached, bonding, which is conflicting, you know? How do two people losing their senses form communication with each other? And for my first Hong Gong, and perhaps not the best way to be introduced to her work, but my interest has been piqued. She has a very particular language that 
tickles my brain and I love it. I love it. After reading this book, I felt absolutely empty <laughs> and I just felt like I needed to read more Hong Kong to sort of understand her, her deal. What's her deal? Really examines language, linguistics, the mechanics of Greek and implication and implications in real world language and how we understand approach language. If you like languages and linguistics and are studying that and also want like a philosophical perspective on it all, this one's a good one. All in all, like a hard three stars, but yes, it was okay. It was fine for what it was. This is, I believe, out already. Yes, April 18th by Hogarth. But yes, pick it up. It's a nice slim one, but it's very dense. And will I reread it again in the future? Perhaps. I don't know. I'm, I'm more interested in Hong Kong now. And being that I live in Korea, I should read more Korean literature. And I have, yes, I have the white book waiting for me on my shelf. And I can't wait to get to that. Yes. And I believe Modern Ajima told me, yes, we did a collab video and she talked about human acts. And I really want to read that one too about the Gwangju uprising, which was a very big, like, democratic student event in Korea that sort of shaped democracy for Korea. So very interested in that. Okay. After that, I had another ARC from MCD will be out June 6th. It is Open Throat by Henry Hoke about a queer mountain lion. Yeah, that's right. It's a gay mountain lion. Slaughter or daughter? This one was fun. It's written in sort of verse. What well, appears to be verse, but it's actually quite the way the mountain lion approaches language. And though that this book is advertised as queer mountain lion, I don't think it actually is. There's like one moment where, I mean, I guess you could say the mountain lion is queer, but it's a fun one. I was afraid it might come off as mm, kitschy, but it, it works. Getting inside the mountain lion's mind and its understanding of humans and what power is and it, through the LA setting and landscape, also a social critique on the homeless issue as well as sort of the idiocracy that LA people are. And yeah, just a lot of fun. A lot of this beautiful look at leveling with the world. I want to say that I read Cannibal Metaphysics last year and there was this whole idea about this whole idea of perspective where we should see the world as human, not as humans existing in the world, which means that we should relink with the world, with us human beings, essentially, but to the core of the world, a single humanity. So, like, instead of seeing a wolf as an animal, something lesser and savage, we should see how it sees us as another species interacting with the world. From an animal's perspective, another example would be the wolf, when it kills, it does not drink blood from another animal in the literary sense that it is vicious and animalistic, but it is drinking the blood as if it is beer, a luxurious elixir, a gift from the earth itself. And Poke really looks at, yes, sort of the silliness of human beings and how they interact with each other, understanding the power structures that humans put upon each other, and where the animal fits in through all of that the mountain lion itself. And a lot of it is also about desire. And it's fun. It's a cute, short, quick one. You can finish it in an afternoon. Lots of fun. It might end up being in my top 10 of this year as like, you know, high 10, you know, somewhere in the nine or 10, just because of its form, function, and the fun and thrill of it all. Given that this was just an ARC, I hope it ends up being a bit more queer because that is false advertisement, baby. Like, don't just put in one scene. <laughs> Give me more gay. It needs to be more gay. Out by MCD, June 6th. Open Throat, Henry Hoke. Oh, wanted to mention, did this as a buddy read with Alex from What Page Are We On? 
what page are we on? What page are you on? I also buddy read another book with him. In this next book that I'm about to talk about, The Guest by Emma Klein. This one is out by Random House, May 16th. If you are looking for a dog days dull summer read, pick this one up. If you're planning to fall asleep in a book, this is the book for you. It's about a gal named Alex who wants to fully remove herself from the world and sort of creates this like false identity in a string of other boys. And this sounds fantastic. A person who wants to be another person, all down. Sounds fun. I want to do that. Execution, mm, it's, it's boring. <laughs> I, I don't know what happened, but like first 50 percent of the book, I was absolutely bored. <laughs> I was like, what, what is going on in this book? Nothing happens. Nothing happens. It's all very dull in plot characters. They're also very stale. And the dialogue is funny every once in a while, but not enough to keep up with. There's so many pages that are going on. This definitely feels like it needs to be cut down. But then again, if you do, they're isn't a lot to to look at or you know be interested in still and yeah it was sort of a letdown because I really wanted to read Daddy her short story collection and I'm, I still might do it just for the cover alone but yeah this one this one was quite quite dull I think uh can safely say Alex and I have have been hate reading this together but uh, we're in it together. We're in it together. I was very close to DNFing it, but I pulled through. I pulled through because I had a lot of time and I was in a lot of airports this month. So yes, there was, there was a lot of downtime, a lot of time on buses, planes, and trains. If you, if you, want, if you want a book to sleep in, this is the one for you, the guest, Emma Klein. Random House, May 16th. Look out for it. Okay. After that, I was kindly sent, where are you? There you are. Games and Rituals by Catherine Haney, by Knopf, by the wonderful Matthew Sharapa. He's, uh, he's a cool one. Love you, Matt, if you're watching this. He also sent me a, a few uh, poetry books as well that I'll talk about, but this was quite a joy. I, I enjoyed this a lot. If you're looking for, you know, if Nora Ephron ever did like, yeah, if she did like a Netflix miniseries, this is what it would be. Just really cute, fun stories that have punch endings of bittersweet love in life and the relationships we have and all the little games and rituals that we play with each other in families, in romantic relationships, in everything, in the silly ways that we exist. The title story is a lot of fun. I think that should have been moved to the beginning, but you know, with short story collections, some just hit better than others. But overall, quite an enjoyable read. I love Nora Ephron. I know this isn't Nora Ephron, but this gave off some real strong Nora Ephron vibes and you know, there are some days where I miss Nora Ephron or people like her, and I don't think another person like her has come into the world. You know what I mean? Same with Carol Burnett. You know, it's the same reign of woman. Carol Burnett, Nora Ephron, Nancy Myers, they're just, they come so few, far in between. Very rare, rare creatures they are. Catherine's a rare one. But yes, lots of fun. It's funny as well. That's why I, uh, I've i made the comparison. The writing's sharp and funny and uh, moves the story, the stories in here um, with much grace. So yes, Games and Rituals, Catherine Haney. Uh, yes, April 18th, out, get it now. A lovely book to gift your mother. When is Mother's Day? <laughs> Ooh, yes, May 14th. Yes, a lovely book to gift your mother without having to say I love you. Games and Rituals, Catherine Haney. Okay, then, oh yes, I had an ARC from Clash Books out by June 6th, Everything the Darkness Eats by Eric 
La Roca. We have rural New England villages where occult forces are conjured and where bigotry is left unrestrained. But yes, in this little village, there are a bunch of dis disappearances occurring and a hate crime, a hate crime against the gays. So we got a queer, dark, gothic, a horror-esque story. And I, I was all in, it was a lot of fun. And by the end, I was like, wow, this is like really good for a YA book. Like, is it really made for kids? I looked it up, <laughs> it is not YA. It's meant for adults. <laughs> uh, mm. And it was because there was like a particular language to it that was just made it feel like it was for kids. Like in a very gruesome and grotesque scene, guts or something, uh, a simile about guts or something was made to the comparison of toothpaste. And I was like, hmm, okay, uh, very YA, very, very tame. You know what I mean? It, it doesn't, anyway, Eric makes quite a few similes and metaphors within the text that don't quite flow with the rest of the book. Therefore, I believe Eric definitely needs to go back and take a, go back to a prose and stylist class because really, I have the quote here, where is it? He thought of such things as he closed his palms tightly and squished the life out of the tiny black slug until it was smeared along the palm of his hand like a toothpaste. What does that have to, give, given this is like also a very gruesome scene, why are you using the imagery of toothpaste to, you know, create this, the sensation of a horror-esque scene? I don't know just doesn't work. And not only that, but there's a lot of examples of this throughout the book, which is why I thought it was a YA book. Yeah, I thought this was cute and all, but Suspiria definitely, definitely did it better. Luca Guadagnino's Suspiria. Given that he made Call Me By Your Name, he should have made Suspiria more lesbian. I don't know why he didn't, but he had that opportunity. And Tilda Swinton's in it. So it's like, you, you could have done it, Luca. You could have done it. But yes, I think if you want something queer and gothic in the horror realm, this, this might be a fun October spooky read for you. But if you don't mind the sort of YA language through similes and metaphors, this one's for you. Yes. Everything the Darkness Eats, Eric LaRocca, out by Clash Books, June 6th. Then I had a series of poetry books because I was like, let's let's do it. Let's get into it. April was poetry month and I was like, let's do it. I want to boost up my count. And so I did. I started with Emil My Emily Dickinson by Susan Howe, gifted to me by the lovely Bibliosophie. Merci beaucoup. This was absolutely beautiful. There's a lot of heart and soul and study that Susan did in the sort of Dickinson realm. And I've never read a lot of Emily Dickinson, but man, the amount of hate that men gave her during the time, you know, colonial time is like insane to me because she was doing, you know, they gave her a lot of flack for her dashes. Like leave the woman alone, geez, Louise. Just because she didn't write in your like old romantic language, like fuck off, honestly. You know what? Men are the fucking same as they are then and now. Piece of shits, let me tell you. But like they gave so much shit <laughs> to Emily Dickinson for like no apparent reason, just because she was like an intellectual woman. God, geez. But no, uh, this was a very beautiful foray into Dickinson's work. This was beautifully done. It's academic, but there's, a lot of um, amour, appreciation for Dickinson, which I enjoyed with uh, Susan Howe's voice and prose. So yes, this was, this was good. Thank you so much, Sophie. This was lots of fun. Then I read Tanya by Brenda Shaughnessy. This was a very wonderful collection of poems examining feminism within the sort of academic world, ideas through art and creation. Brenda has a very strong grasp on language and its control and how words are situated against each other, with each other, and is able to create very strong concrete ideas through prose, which 
I enjoyed, yeah. Just um, the appreciation of women and the art of women in the academic world. So yes, Tanya, Brenda, Shaughnessy. Pick it up. Poetry continued on with Quiet Poems by Victoria Bully. This was incredible. I thoroughly enjoyed this. Examinations of the Black female body in poetry and plays a lot with form. There's, I talk about it in my, in a future vlog, but she does this thing with repetition and the ideas of repetition that sort of exaggerate and fluctuate the feeling and ethos of all of her poems. They definitely have this like living, breathing quality to them. There's this one where it's called Noise. I talk about it in a future vlog, you'll see, but there's these blank spaces throughout the poem. And I was, as I was reading the poem, that space, those blank spaces, accentuated in my head. And as it was accentuated in my head, it like happened in my speech. And it came to a point where there like, silence made a noise. Like silence became the white noise and these pauses meant something. These pauses had a weight. And it's just incredible the way that she is able to use repetition as a tool to create these living, breathing pieces within this collection. Yes, this is definitely something I'll revisit as I think it's a really interesting exploration in terms of form from like a living, breathing quality, if that makes any sense. Like if I'm seeking living, breathing text, this is a nice book to look at, to examine form as a way to give breath to a piece of work. I sound insane. I sound like Dr. Frankenstein, but yes, quiet, Victoria Adequay Bully. So, so good. From the UK. She's, she's got an incredible voice and incredible rhythm in her language. Really enjoyed this. Okay. And, oh yes, we have another poetry book. This one is out by Farrar and Strauss, September 5th. The Lights, Ben Lerner. Love Ben. I've read Ben in classes and what is it? The Poetry Foundation. You know, I've, I've read bits and bobs there it was in like magazines and such as well. And yeah, reading Ben is lots of fun. This one is definitely pandemic poetry book with examinations at the social events at large, thoughts on the Ukraine war, the pandemic as well, just social and cultural life as we know it now. And also examinations of what it means to be a father. Yes, I said this was a nitro cold brew too strong in the chrysalis of a Philip Glass song or a Zaha Hadid building. There's a lot of like existential wonder and awe through these poems and where you'll be in one place in one line and in the next stanza you'll be somewhere else completely. And it's through these sort of leaps from idea to idea that you sort of get lost in it all and you feel like a very tiny speck in the universe. And there's this lonely quality to it, but also because he makes us feel like tiny specks, he also understands that he is a tiny speck and it's this like collective tiny speck speckling <laughs> that, you know, the world, you know, it's a small world after all. A lovely tiny little existential collection of poems. Yeah, enjoyed it. Enjoyed it. But yes, The Lights, Ben Lerner, out by Farron Strauss in September, September 5th. Look out for it. Yeah, I never read Ben Lerner as like a complete collection or like any of his collections. I've only read like bits and bobs here and there. I think I prefer reading his work in that manner versus a collection. So there's definitely one of those collections where, you know, you read one poem and then, you know, pick up something else. It's a good in-between read, in-between things. Yes. But yes, Ben Lerner. Then I was like, it's time to pick up a novel. It's time to, you know, read something a little longer in form. And of course I picked up a tiny read. 
We did The Hole by Hiroko Oyamada. I picked up this book because of another YouTuber, but I know Pato recently read this and I bought it simply because of the cover. That's just a fun cover. And The Hole, oh, I can make a, we can go on, whole comedy tour based on the t title alone, but it's about this husband and wife who recently move to a town because of his work and some odd things go on, odd, odd things. And because of its short form factor, sort of the fantastical strange elements don't really flesh out that well because it relies too heavily on atmosphere, which made this somewhat of a di disappointing read. But if you wanna go into the foray of little strange Japanese books, this this might this might pique your interest. If you haven't read any Japanese literature and you pick this up, I can understand. This would be like a cute introductory course. Honestly, this one felt a little flat for me. And yeah, we'll talk about that more in a future vlog. So yeah, the whole Hiroko Oyamada. Then I was like, I was so disappointed by this. Then I was like, it's, it's time to go back to poems. <laughs> so we did Jane. Maggie Nelson, I know, uh, Sunny's Book Truck. This was a book club pick recently. Yeah, I was hungry. I was hungry for some Maggie Nelson. And this one was just really, really interesting. Looks at Nelson's Aunt Jane, who was murdered. And Maggie Nelson never knew her Aunt Jane, but she got to know her and know about her by creating this wonderful collection of prose poems that sort of dissect her diary entries, news clippings, and just thoughts and ideas on loss and death and what it means to know a person and getting to know a person and all of those unasked questions that you want to ask a person who passed away too quickly and without, without much justice. And yeah, just beautifully done. Might revisit this in the future. Then I did an ARC, which ended up not being an ARC. <laughs> it was just a free ebook off of this ARC site. And I think it'll be my last because I, I don't really, yeah. I was hoping, there's this other site that's much like NetGalley. Some of the reads are just not, not it. But this was published by Bis Business Expert Press. Um, August 26, 2022, Telling Your Story, Building Your Brand by Henry Wong. I don't know. It's not like I want to build a brand myself, but I was curious, you know? Sometimes I'm curious about, like, how people create... I don't know. I just wanted, like, a nonfiction read, too. And this was kind of short, so I was like, why not? But this ended up being a very flat way of learning how to tell a story, which just didn't work for me given that I, I, I read way too much. So it's not that I know how a story forms, but like I have a pretty good idea. <laughs> so I, I don't, I didn't need this. I didn't need to read about this. And I feel like I could have saved a lot more time watching, you know, a 15 minute bullet point TED talk video or like you know, being on business TikTok for 30 minutes instead of reading this. Yeah. Also, Wong doesn't believe in the longevity and keeping social media presence in a Silicon Valley pumped 21st century. So Wong dates himself and you also see that his references are quite dated. He's a, a decade behind, I want to say. He's contemporary, but a decade behind. He's he's not for the Gen Zers. Definitely not. He's definitely for his own party. I think you can skip this one. I think you're better off being on business TikTok for 30 minutes than reading this. If you're planning to start your brand and learning how to uh, tell a story. And this is why I think I said in my um, 1K Q&A video, read everything in your 20s. Because if you read everything, you kind of understand how different genres, fiction, nonfiction, essay, play. You learn all of these different ways and mechanics and how people form story and how you can relay a story. So yes, this is this is why you read everything in your 20s. Read everything. Then I did Teaching a Stone to Talk by Annie Dillard. Did this 
as a buddy read with John. I'll leave John's handle below. He's on Instagram. But yes, it was so good to be back in Dillard's mind. You know what's so great? That you can live in a city and pick up people like Mary Oliver and Dillard and just be like, ah, oh, yes, I'm one with nature once again. And I didn't even have to step out of the city. So fun. But yes, my first Dillard was... I'm gonna fuck up the title because I always fuck it up. It's Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. Pilgrim at Tinker... Ooh, say that five times fast. Let me see. Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. Yes, that was my first Dillard and absolutely loved it. And it's been a long time coming, coming back to Dillard. And this was a lot of varying essays through nature expeditions from eclipses to the jungles of Ecuador. Yeah, and just leveling with nature focuses on silences and the idea of silence, not as the enemy, but as moments of solace and understanding of, again, what I read about in Cannibal Metaphysics, uh, perspectivism. But yeah, I mean, the whole beginning essay is about death and clowns. And then she goes into her fear about Santa Claus. I mean, what's not to love? When I read Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, I thought it was like very, very serious. But here she's a little more light. There's a, there's a bit of humor. She levels with a weasel. And it's through that leveling with a weasel do, she, do we understand this idea of perspectivism and just, you know, being one with nature being friends and not seeing things as other, but as togetherness. Yeah, super good. Also, I always thought like Dillard was always on shrooms, but it's just coffee. She admits it. She has a, a strong third cup of coffee, cup of joe. Um, in one of the essays, she talks about it, but yeah, it's, it's good. Dillard's always good. Enjoyed this thoroughly. And then, Oh, yes, yes, beautiful. I did a buddy read of Aftermath by Rachel Cusk with the lovely Renee from So I Read This Book. Great as always, love Renee's brain. This was my first nonfiction, Cusk nonfiction. I've only read two of the outline books and yeah, never read her nonfiction, but this was such a beautiful look at the way she takes her writer self and how she applies it to her real life and how interconnected the two are and really shines in the end. I thought the end was just brilliant and I'm not gonna talk much more about it because future vlogs, but also I think you should just leave it up to, to mystery and on your own accord, but looks at her divorce and the roles of man and woman within a relationship and what it means to, you know, deal with all that when you have children. It's interesting to look at divorce from a writer's perspective and seeing how they unpack all of like the anxieties and trauma of that with writing elements. Yeah, and it's, it's beautiful the way Cusk works and how, how fiction Cusk works in real life Cusk. I'm talking as if she like, isn't like a, you know, human being, but it, it's incredibly human, incredibly humane. And I, I picked up the last outline trilogy book because of this, cause I was like, I miss Cusk, I miss Cusk. And, and this was, this was absolutely fantastic. Also, I just love this cover. It's so minimalist, it's so brutalist, but it's like, I don't know, Picador. This collection of like Picador books of Cusk's work is just like brilliant. I wanna catch them all. Okay, then, oh yes, my very last ARC of the month. And God, this video is already 44 minutes. I apologize, but yes, last ARC of the month out by Knopf, June 20th. It is I Am Homeless, if this is not by home, by your home girl, Lori Moore. It's a ghost story, essentially. Lori Moore does Ghost, If It Was Waking Life, written by Nora Ephron, directed by Nancy Myers. But yeah, it's just really whimsical, smart, funny, and examines this heavy topic of death and what we do with it and the afterlife and what the body means after it, regret, love, romance, loss just all of it. And it's never too heavy. 
because we got Lori Moore, and Lori Moore just does dialogue wonderfully in humor. This is her first novel in a decade, which is insane. And yeah, always loved Lori Moore. Her short stories are wonderful. Always read her in classes. She's the people's writer. Always, always such a fun voice. But yeah, I don't want to talk much about it because it's definitely more of an atmospheric book versus like a plot heavy book. That's why I made the Waking Life comparison, but it's, yeah, feels almost like a stage play in a sense with a lot of the dialogue and a lot of it is also written in letters as well. So just a very interesting form in terms of the novel for Laurie Moore after like such a long time. So yeah, if anything, also it feels like an extended short story at times. That's how I felt at the beginning. But after the 50% mark, I, I sort of sort of realize what she was trying to go for in terms of the ideas of death, elevated life, and the afterlife. But yes. Knopf, June 20th. Lori Moore. I am homeless if this is not my home. If you are a Lori Moore stan, I definitely recommend you pick this up. It's a lot of fun. Okay, last but not least, the last book of April. I did it, y'all, I did it. We did Boulder by Ava Balthazar. Y'all were right. All you booktube hotties were right. This is so sexy. So wrought with like raw honesty and romance and lust and desire. Ah! A woman who works as a cook on a boat falls in love with another woman in Iceland. And she's got beef with a baby. Got beef with a baby. But like, you know, beef with the idea of a baby first. And it's just, in a future vlog, I will give a drunk review of this book, essentially. <laughs> and I think that will do it much more justice, surprisingly, than me talking about it now. But everyone is reading this because you should be reading it. So good. Especially for such a tiny book. It's just packed with so much feeling. And the translation, Julia Sanchez, oh, incredible. Such a wonderful, wonderful translation. But yes, Boulder, Eva Balthazar, loved it. Strong four stars. Y'all were right. Trust, trust in the booktube hotties. I love y'all. You put me on good. I love y'all for this one. That is April in a motherfucking rap. Okay, also, I need to tell myself to stop cursing, but, like, that, that was a lot. Okay, this, this, this was, like, way too much. So, mind the cursing, I'm sorry. But, yes, costume change, same video, different day, but I also wanted to include my quick movie watch list of this month. I only watched three movies <laughs> versus the 20 that I watched last month. So what I think I did was like, I watched 20 movies last, I watched a bunch of movies last month and a few books last month. And then, you know, they're verse, they're verse. Literature, films, they're, they're verse, you know, doing their tops and bottom services. But I watched three movies in April. I watched The Last Seduction, which was so good. If anyone needs like a long, fun 90s film, it's about a woman who escapes an abusive relationship to make a new name for herself in a town while this old ex-boyfriend is still trying to hunt her down um, because she stole a shit ton of money. But it's the OG Gone Girl. But Linda Florentino is in it and she's impeccably gorgeous and savage. It's incredible. She has this like long black coat that she always wears and she has two bags. She's got this little sexy night bag and a big canvas tote and that's it. That's her whole identity and she's so bitchy. It's great. Go watch it. It's a lot of fun, unhinged, and yeah, I think my new comfort watch. I've been saying I've been having a lot of new comfort watches given that I don't re-watch movies enough, but there's that. And in the continuation of watching top faves 
from my faves, my favorite people. Uh, my friend recommended I watch Reality Bites with Winona Ryder, Ethan Hawke, Ben Stiller, and that was really fun. He had said that it made such a huge impact on him after he graduated uni, and it's very much about your 20-somethings post-grad and not really getting life together. And yeah, I could watch it for just Winona herself, just sitting on a couch and lazing around and watching daytime television. It's great. Lots of great lines in it. Still holds up with the same sentiments of, yeah, just being lost in your 20s. Really good. And the last movie I watched was You've Got Mail by Nora Ephron with Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan. And it's just so, oh, such a charming and comforting watch. I know Modern Ajima talked about this film in one of her videos not long ago, but oh, it's just New York during the fall, email, just really great lines and uh, also a new comfort watch. <laughs> I'd watch it like years ago with my mom, like it was on TBS or something during the holidays or something or other, and I didn't really pay much attention to it um, given that I'd seen it when I was like 13, so it didn't make much of it. But I remember the bookstores and just like being in love with the environment of books, but rewatching it again and just like, you can tell Nora Ephron's love for books and love for uh, charming bookstores is, is just so beautiful. And uh, yeah, I cried. I cried at the end. It, w it was a good, it was a good cry. I had a good time with that. And yeah, we'll probably revisit it when fall comes around because it's just such great fall vibes. Love it. In New York, like how could you not? And yeah, that's three films. Hopefully I watch more films in May. I know I'll have a bit more downtime in the later weeks of May. So hopefully we get some... Uh, movie watching done. Like, I want to catch some theater watches too. Like, Bo is Not Afraid, I really want to watch. I want to watch the new Super Mario movie. I want to watch the new Barbie movie. Like, when is that coming out in Korea? I'm movie hungry. Is the book reading gonna chill? Is the reading gonna chill? I don't think so. But yeah, hope, hope to do lots of books, lots of movies in May. Okay. Let me know what you read in April. What should I be reading? If you, if you got more book to hottie books, let me know. Put me on. And yeah, very curious to know what people are reading. I love adding books to my TBR. This life is an endless list of books. It's my entire life. It's my entire identity at this point. Okay, well, on that note, Oh, I'm almost at my reading goal. Just wanted to give a quick shout out to, to Goodreads. Not sponsored by Goodreads, but Goodreads, my reading challenge is 52 books this year in 2023. That's a book a week, which I think is pretty good. We're at 48. 48 books, and I just finished my first book of May, so we're actually at 49. Now it's like the scary part where it's like, okay, if I really want to hit 100, we gotta go. <laughs> we gotta go, because it's almost middle of the year already so yeah gotta keep up the same pace i guess but i did way too much in april like i'm already looking at july because <laughs> i'm fucking insane i'm a big planner i love to plan but like yeah i'm already looking at the end of july for free time that's that's where we're at right now but yes okay before this video is an hour long i'm gonna cut off now and say be well do good work keep in touch